Hello, welcome to the uh, third lecture uh, in the series for risk assessment and LCA in the ecology and environment course. Uh, in the last uh, lecture, we looked at transport uh, of uh, chemicals from the uh, source into the environment and to receptors and different scenarios in which it can happen and some uh, simple uh, mechanistic uh, ideas about that. Um, we stopped at a point when we uh, uh, post this question, uh, can we do anything about these health risks and uh, we will look at the uh, different options we have and where we can intervene. Um, before that, we look at some examples of um, what we call as the sources and what are their effects. So, in this, uh, I have a, a series of uh, um, the uh, pathway of the, uh, the pollutant from the source to a, uh, to a receptor in terms of health effects is uh, given here. And uh, corresponding to this, uh, I will give you a few examples. For example, there are thermal power, power plants are coal fired. We have uh, the sources, uh, combustion of coal results in the emission of um, certain exhaust uh, gases and particulate matter and uh, these are transported, released into the air and they are dispersed and transported into air and there are different uh, processes that happen. One of them is deposition, the exchanges with land as well as in water. So, this is a uh, uh, this is well known, uh, people have measured the rate at which materials can uh, transfer from air into uh, a phase such as water or land and we also see that there is an effect on vegetation. Uh, uh, so, that is one effect uh, and when it comes into the environment and you can get exposed directly to human beings uh, through air or through vegetation uh, or it can react to buildings. So, there is instances where several buildings have had damage, monumental buildings um, uh, and then uh, there is this big case uh, and eventually there is uh, an effect. So, one of the more common effects seen here are respiratory in nature uh, for this particular source. There is also another big uh, category of effects which is acid rain which uh, came into prominence because of the acidic nature of the uh, rainwater because of interaction between the uh, pollutants SO2 and water vapor droplets of water in the atmosphere and this pertains to the chemistry of the sulfur uh, oxides with water and uh, what it does to the uh, pH of rainwater, the acidity of rainwater. So, the other example uh, one can look at is a very uh, classic example that is used uh, in atmospheric long range atmospheric transport is that of chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs uh, which were used as refrigerants. Uh, air conditioning uh, foams and in propellants and various applications and it is released into air uh, as a result of their usage or as a result of leaks or uh, incorrect uh, disposal or defunct equipment. Uh, during that time you throw away uh, the uh, compressor and the uh, fluid. So, things released get, gets released into the environment and uh, and it is transported into the uh, uh, to the stratosphere and we saw that yesterday in the in the graph there and there it reacts with the uh, ozone and results uh, in their destruction this ozone hole. Indirect effect of this destruction of ozone uh, is the transmission of UV onto the uh, earth surface and therefore, it has effects and can cause cancer and other atmospheric reactions. The third example uh, uh, is a generic example that for any manufacturing industry, uh, we have processing chemicals, several processing chemicals that are um, used in the uh, industry and uh, as a result of which there is a waste stream and every industry has some waste stream and which, which may be released into water or soil or air and uh, uh, if they are released into soil, they percolate into soil contaminating the soil and eventually traveling to reach ground water and further traveling to reach uh, uh, a receptor through a well and direct disposal in water may also lead to contamination of sediments uh, as we saw yesterday and uh, this uh, one can come directly into contact with the uh, receptor can come directly in contact with the water or air uh, with, with the water and then or with the other um, plants and animals which uh, come through through the food chain. So, different constituents depending on what is being released uh, it can cause different uh, illnesses. Um, there is a, a category, it is a very loosely defined category of events that uh, one is concerned about. 
what is this what is called as a planned or registered and th these are the term is used very loosely here but what it means is that there is a known manufacturing facility or a factory or a plant um, which uh, is making a product everybody knows about that the government knows about it everybody knows it is not a, a, a clandestine activity uh, or vehicles on the roads which are registered. So, you can go and count the number of vehicles on the road by looking at the uh, data of the uh, road transport authority they, will, they can tell you how many vehicles are there and what type and all that or consumer goods sold in the market these are events or these are planned uh, activities and planned products and processes as a result of which we can uh, look at the emissions or the pollution that can come out of these things which is known. So, one can really uh, understand that and, and, and one can plan for it, one can account for it. What cannot be account, accounted for is accidents which are uh, events that are not supposed to happen in the normal course of uh, things. But in all the planned and registered uh, activities there is a possibility of an accident happening for example, there is an explosion or there is a spill so on land on water or under water. Uh, so, there are several examples of uh, oil spills uh, on land uh, or a ship carrying it breaks and uh, what oil is uh, spilt on open sea or underwater pipeline carrying oil uh, spills oil and it, uh, we have a big problem on our hands if that happens and there are leaks. Um, leaks of pipelines which is, which is an accident and then there is of course, forest fire which uh, which some cases is natural sometimes sometimes there is uh, it is human made. So, uh, these are one set and there is also uh, another set of uh, events which are unregistered which means that there is activities like open burning. Uh, so, in the current context um, open burning of garbage is uh, not allowed. Uh, by the Indian regulatory agencies uh, such as the Central Pollution Control Board, uh, but we you see it happening from time to time uh, in different scales very small scale to large scale people burn uh, waste organic waste sometimes uh, they also burn things like plastic and uh, there are issues with doing that and then can cause uh, a pollution um, specific to the burning of plastic and cause different uh, ailments over a period of time and then dumping of waste or hazardous material in public uh, regulated land or water. So, this is uh, uh, this is similar to what when you see people there is a garbage dump and people go and do not go and throw garbage in it they throw it outside. So, it is it is an equivalent of that and uh, this can happen. So, these are these are the three kinds of events that one must keep in mind when we plan for uh, these kind of things, but we, we cannot plan for unregistered uh, event, but we can definitely plan for accidents. Uh, in what we call as emergency management response management. So, uh, this is a worst case scenario and should be planned for and this is definitely should be planned and designed uh, when we come to the uh, environmental management. Um, so, there are other couple of other terms that are very specific to exposure when it comes to a source. One is this is called as occupational exposure. Occupational we, we looked at exposure in the previous two lectures. Uh, exposure which is related to a particular occupation or activity uh, it is called as occupational exposure and uh, for example, there is an industry and within a certain distance from the industry which is say the perimeter of the industry you are likely to find very high concentration. For example, you go to a construction site in the construction site you are likely to see a lot of uh, uh, crushing happening or uh, work with cement which there is a lot of pollution there. Uh, usually you see that the, uh, the area is confined they cover it up with uh, some kind of a, uh, a barrier. So, that the, the dust does not go out, but people who are working inside are exposed to that dust. So, that is called as occupational exposure. So, th this occurs in every field anybody who is working with a chemical is likely to be exposed to a very high concentration than people who are outside. So, as you can see uh, this is based on a slide we saw yesterday there is a certain uh, region within the uh, uh, a distance away from the uh, source that the concentration is likely to be high and beyond that it, it reduces. So, uh, this is this zone within this zone you, you are likely to have an occupational exposure standard and away from it uh, we call it as uh, it is far away it is not under the influence directly of this particular uh, plant. Occupational ex exposure examples are all this and uh, what I mentioned in terms of a construction and all that. So, there are different types of uh, occupational exposure, there are some examples of that. 
Ambient exposure on the other hand is something that is not associated with a specific activity. So, anybody who is walking on a street uh, and, and no, n does not have anything to do with any activity, uh, that person is uh, exposed to what we call as an ambient uh, concentration. So, our focus in uh, as a society is to maintain concentrations of chemicals below a certain level in the ambient zone. So, um, so this is here in this uh, same schematic we are talking about this and it is very far away from the source. So, it is also known as background concentration. So, what we are what, what we call as background is, is specifically not related to any activity. For example, if you are standing uh, next to an automobile you are exposed to emissions from the automobile, but you are standing very far away from it, you are standing in a playground that is a kilometer from a road you are exposed to something, but this something is, is a background concentration. So, this background concentration can increase over a period of time if the amount of pollution released into the environment keeps on increasing. So, this is similar to what we uh, to the concentration of CO2, the background concentration of CO2 or the average concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, we are talking about CO2 and methane in terms of greenhouse uh, gases and global warming. This is what we are talking about. We are talking about an average concentration across a very large region that, that is increasing uh, and this increase occurs over a slow, slowly over a period of time and this is what we are worried about and we are also, uh, so, so uh, these are two things specifications that and uh, people differentiate between these two. Um, so, can we intervene and uh, the answer is uh, yes, we can intervene in multiple places. So, we know this uh, pathway, we know a source, we know where it is going, you know what it is going to cause and we can intervene in, in, a, in, in a couple of ways. One is emission control which means that we can stop it at the source okay? and the second is we cannot stop it at the source, we at least stop uh, a receptor from uh, getting exposed to it, this is the easy part. And in the third case where you are, you are, uh, you are not able to stop the source but it is in the environment already and this happens uh, specifically in the case of soil or sediment pollution where it is directly not coming to you yet, it has not come to you yet, it has not, you have not been exposed to you to, to the agent, but it may come to you at some point in time in the future. So, then you have to look at something, we have to remedy that situation, so it is called environmental remediation and uh, we look at emission control first. Uh, the first methodology that one can do for emission control is is by prevention completely, uh, which does not mean that we stop the process that is a, uh, a drastic method and which has consequences for economic and social uh, uh, aspects of sustainability. So, this is where we, we have the term sustainability takes an important uh, uh, um, connotation here because we then as technologists have a role to play in trying to devise methodologies where we can still sustain the economics. Uh, of the uh, society uh, by uh, looking at alternative ways of producing things uh, and uh, this which may be um, a bit more expensive, a bit more difficult to do than th the original method that was sought after, but it is uh, eventually on the whole sustainable. So, this, this, this term called green chemistry and by extension what is called as a green process, these are all uh, terms that were coined in the last few decades. The idea is here to, to Opt, adopt processes which mitigate hazard from chemicals and this, this can be done in various ways and one of the uh, more commonly seen uh, approach is to use biodegradable alternatives because uh, one of the concerns uh, that we have is the accumulation of a chemical in the environment and the case in point is plastic. Uh, you have all seen a, a lot of uh, attention that is paid to plastic uh, of different kinds accumulation of plastic in our society in different forms, uh, in form in the com form of complete products such as uh, mobile phones or computers or anything or to plastic bags which is there which is uh, found everywhere all around us and so on. So, there is regulation from different governments in different states that you cannot get plastic bags unless you pay for it and you cannot uh, throw them away here and there and so on and so forth to try to discourage people from using more and more plastic. And, uh, so, when plastic was formed, uh, was invented, whenever it was invented in, in the uh, around, around uh, the 50s, 60s, it, uh, it became a big industry at that time. Um, 
people did not envisage uh, the uh, idea that plastics will be there and uh, the idea of plastics not being able to degrade very easily was not a very serious op uh, po point at that point at that time because uh, there was no resource crunch there was no pressure on uh, on uh, the population for space and other things in india places like india we have other pressures of space uh, where options for disposal and all that is very less so we see the effect a lot, lot more than a few other countries so this is uh, so we see a reaction to this increase in plastics in ways in which uh, we want to use biodegradable alternatives we don't want to use plastic we'll use some other option so this is a, this is a, an example of that and the, the ban on chlorofluorocarbons as refrigerants because they were causing a bad effect in the stratosphere resulted in people looking for alternatives so we have we need refrigerants and uh, people look for other refrigerants now there is a um, the idea is to get something that is better from an environmental perspective it does not mean that an alternative has a zero effect every alternative has some effect uh, if not here in the way in which the current uh, methodology is uh, has an effect it may have an effect in some other sphere and one has to investigate that thoroughly in before coming to a conclusion so automatically no option becomes a, a perfectly green option there is always uh, uh, a shade of uh, some effect there and one has to investigate as, as engineers and scientists one must be aware of that and, uh, and then uh, uh, provide options for society so that they can uh, use a better option as if, if available. And um, one of the uh, goals here is again energy and we have not talked about energy really in this course uh, we will talk a lot about it in a different module is linked to environment in some case because some of the energy pr production methodologies involve uh, um, involve uh, release of uh, materials that are harmful to the environment uh, not from a health perspective but from a climate change perspective uh, uh, also. So energy requirements or energy also is, is cost is uh, amount uh, cost that is involved in doing it. So these are all very intricately linked and this is where I think uh, um, uh, one should appreciate and uh, recognize the uh, interlinkages of the different uh, arms of sustainability that there is no single clean solution or there is no single absolute solution for it you still have to optimize it with the other two angles of sustainability the economics and the society in general. And uh, continuing on this uh, there are other uh, options that one can use um, and we will come back to this uh, a little later uh, in the when we talk about uh, design uh, and the life cycle assessment. So the other option of, of doing emission control is if you cannot change the process, if, if it is not possible to change the process, there is no alternative. Um, for example, if you have, uh, so right now the, the big example is uh, automobile, uh, automobile. So we, we use petrol or diesel as automobiles, uh, fuel or LPG or CNG um, and they all have different emission profiles. They all emit something, uh, SOx, NOx or the unburned hydrocarbons and particulate matter and um, so the idea is no we do not want to use any of these fuels one that is process change a green uh, process is that let us use electrical vehicles okay so electrical vehicles do not emit anything because they it does not work on a combustion principle uh, but right now we do not have an electrical vehicle that is available in the market for a uh, price that all of us can afford so it, it is still in that phase of development research and development so we are we are still stuck with fuels using fossil fuels then we cannot just throw our hands and wait there but we do control emission control and so there people have devised methodologies by uh, looking at catalytic converters and other method all car companies have uh, big research wings where they look at the uh, of, of getting methodologies by which they can control the particulate matter and the other emissions that are coming out and so you have this different uh, uh, ratings of uh, Bharat 5, Bharat 6, Euro 5, Euro 6 and so on. So we have, we have different things that are that is uh, implemented by the industry and by the government. So this is there in all the sectors. So we do not have, uh, we cannot prevent the pollution from occurring, we at least control it from entering the environment. And so we filter, uh, we recycle, we take it back and put it back into the process and do not allow it to come out um, by innovative management of the process uh, itself or we have destroyed we we destroyed so chemicals cannot be destroyed completely they don't go into they don't become zero they they convert to something else 
it does convert usually to carbon dioxide and water or ammonia or some such thing which is which has a less impact on health than the original waste product might be but it has some other impact so in the case of if you burn the waste by incineration it is technology that uh, is controlled use is, uh, is acceptable in some cases incineration will produce carbon dioxide and uh, carbon dioxide if you convert all the waste to carbon dioxide then there is an issue of uh, producing greenhouse gas. So as I said earlier there is no uh, absolute perfect solution for it, it is only better solution and, and then we have to make a decision whether this is better than that so that assessment has to be done but options are available. So we also have water pollution end of pipeline treatment methodology this is the general term that is used is end of pipeline and before it enters the environment and so before release we have treatment uh, technologies we have effluent treatment plants in so community resource treatment where we have a large section of industry um, which uh, uh, they can pool their resources and make a common effluent treatment plan before it enters uh, the water uh, gets out of their uh, thing. So many of the uh, corporations industry now have a, a zero waste uh, management plan. Um, this is sometimes implemented by the government sometimes the uh, corporations themselves have adopted it as a, as a methodology to both save uh, resources as well as to, uh, to help in the, uh, in the efforts towards making uh, it a more sustainable environment and so uh, uh, all these uh, are possibilities. So the other option of uh, intervention can occur through what we call as uh, exposure control. So it is already out in the air and this happens of air and water, what can we do? So we can protect ourselves uh, by using safety equipment. So here for exposure control it comes now, exposure control now has two particular uh, methodology, uh, particular sections, one is occupational hazard. So we have, we saw earlier in this, in this lecture that we have a very large uh, significant section of population who are working somewhere and at their place of work there is some occupational hazard and uh, so safety is now becomes a big issue so which is so safety is usually seen as fire safety and electrical safety and all that but we call it as uh, uh, environmental health and safety and this is becoming a big uh, thing and it's part of uh, all corporations all all major industries have this uh, a section uh, safety and environmental health and uh, one has to invest in safety and personal protection devices. These devices uh, depending on what the operation is can, can vary from having filter masks, masks for vapors, masks for particulate matter and you see people, you can go and see images on the, on the internet where you can see you, uh, if you look for safety equipment you will see a whole range of uh, safety equipment and uh, starting with the helmet, so the helmet is obviously a protection device but these for the exposure pathways that we have we discussed in this class mainly the inhalation and the ingestion um, we need safety equipment and uh, the safety is integrated into the design. So whenever a new building is, uh, uh, is designed one needs to take into account. So for two reasons one is normal operation business as usual where in the normal operation you have exposure that is one. Second a very important part is emergency response. So if there is a, a, an un, unexpected activity like a spill or an accident or a fire one needs to quickly uh, react to that and so that has to be integrated into the design and it is in the best interest of corporations to do this because there is an issue of liability uh, both to the uh, workers as well as to the general public and uh, the, the other issue is if there is, if you, if the employer does not provide for safety equipment uh, and if the workers fall sick there is loss of productivity that is the, the monetizing uh, aspect here that if you have loss of productivity and most of the companies uh, if they lose uh, worker hours then there is loss of productivity and there is loss of income, there is loss of uh, revenue for the company and so therefore uh, in a way in the investment that they make on safety uh, of their uh, workforce is a good investment in the long run and there are other social aspects to this uh, uh, which we won't go into deep but you can look at uh, things around that there are some aspects some uh, operations in our society where uh, uh, there are certain social uh, issues where uh, safety is still we, we still need to get to the point where we enforce all these uh, safety issues irrespective of uh, the kind of operation it is. 
uh, in the ambient environmental safety, what people look for is uh, inexpensive and pollution, uh, inexpensive pollution control technologies. For example, water filters, this is one of the main uh, concerns that we have is that we drink water, uh, we do not know if it is safe. So, many of us do not drink tap water, some of us do drink tap water, but many of us in general I have uh, in the last 20, 20 years or so I have not seen people drinking tap water because they are not sure if the tap water is clean and for various reasons, maybe it is clean and nobody wants to take the risk. So, we have either water filters or we have we buy filtered water and so this is uh, an exposure control in some sense and uh, we also use safe food. We have we would like to know where the food is coming from and how it is being cooked and all that, uh, all that is uh, intuitive and we have clean air. So, uh, clean air is, uh, is something which we have lesser control over than the other two because air is everywhere, it pervades everywhere unless you are sitting in an, in a, in an air conditioned hospital, uh, in an air conditioned office where the air is purified, if it is purified. Uh, for example, hospital air is purified, it goes through a very rigorous purification system, the air conditioning system because it is. Uh, it, it is does not come under ambient, uh, it comes under uh, occupational uh, this thing because there are patients and there are other activity going on in a hospital and therefore, the risk uh, of uh, air pollution bio biological particles that are is, is higher. So, they have a purification system and so, there is a wide variety of masks and filters for both water and uh, air uh, pollution. So, you see people uh, standing on the road, walking on the road covering their faces with uh, uh, handkerchiefs and masks, wearing masks. Um, sometimes it is inconvenient and uh, in a place where it is uh, very hot and very humid, it becomes uh, extremely difficult for people to manage and they have to walk on the roads and therefore, they have to have uh, uh, some kind of device that, that is uh, both convenient and inexpensive and that is that is the other thing. And so, as a technologist one needs to evaluate and provide uh, inexpensive air pollution uh, devices and a lot of these are already there in the market, corporations make them and I think it is uh, they are trying to make it much more cheaper and uh, for everybody to use and. So, what happens if there is damage done to the environment already? So, examples of this are historically contaminated soil. So, what happens is people do not realize if somebody does not realize that there is a leak happening or people do not know if there is for lack of any other information the chemicals have been uh, dumped or in as in the case of uh, uh, Bhopal uh, near the uh, old uh, Union Carbide site, there is a factory that has been abandoned because of the accident in 1984. The accident does not did not cause the contaminated soil, but there is a lot of stockpile of chemicals that were there, it is a manufacturing facility and, and nothing was done to it. So, it slowly some of there was damage, physical damage and a lot of it enters into the soil and there is a lot of uh, uh, serious problems that are happening because of this and not because of uh, the original accident that, that has its effects yes, but uh, there is a follow through of this because of the uh, site it was not uh, taken care of and that, that I think has uh, can cause these kind of things. And also sites near old landfills and disposal sites, uh, historically the what we say by historically is decades, we are not talking about one year or two years, we are talking about decades. Um, and historically contaminated sediment, again uh, as I mentioned when we talked about contaminated sediments, sediments are not in view, they are under water. So, people do not know what is going on unless they measure or they see some symptoms in the water. And so, by the time they see a symptom and they realize what is going on it is probably a few decades uh, contaminated uh, sediments have existed. So, there are very uh, prominent cases the river uh, Rhine uh, uh, in Europe goes through Germany and a few other countries and then river Hudson in the United States and we have river Ganga, a lot of industries around Ganga and, uh, and there is a lot of focus on the clean up of river Ganga. Uh, but river Rhine uh, has been cleaned, it used to be uh, uh, there are a lot of chemical companies around that and it was remediated, it was cleaned up. We will talk a little bit about some of the options that we will take one case study or at least the general principles behind doing uh, such such kind of remediation. And uh, we also have contaminated marshlands, this is very common. So, marshlands or estuaries uh, are there in estuaries or in inland lakes, uh, a, very, a very large number of them in India as well and there is a big a very delicate ecosystem there and uh, 
uh, because they are, they, if they are in any close proximity to any commercial activity, there is a very, very good chance that they are all contaminated. So, we intervene in under those conditions also in what we call as environmental remediation. So, environmental remediation is a term that is used for, uh, for correcting, for uh, for fixing the mistake, uh, fixing a problem. So, as uh, uh, the term suggests, or the word itself suggests. So, we, in the next lecture, we will look at what are the issues with environmental remediation. What are the options first, and then we look at what are the issues and how can it be done. And there are other issues because it's been done already done. So, uh, we have a question of uh, liability in this. So, we will look at in the next lecture. We look at liability and some of these issues related with remediation and. Uh, which are, which are legal in nature and, uh, and uh, what are the terms that people usually uh, uh, look for in these kind of systems. And if there is any risk associated with this remediation itself, as I mentioned, no process is free from effects. So, we would like to see what are the effects of some of these uh, processes. Thank you.